listening to the Agent Survival Guide podcast. A podcast for today's insurance agents. Informing. Educating. Empowering. Improving the way you do business in an industry that's anything but static. In today's episode, I've recently had the privilege of chatting with Gabe Isaacson, an associate partner at McKinsey and Company, about the future of Medicare after the baby boomer surge. We've certainly got a little bit of time before that officially happens, but this was a fun conversation. There's a lot to consider as we move closer to 2030 and Gen X begins their retirement. Gabe graciously answered my questions, even the ones that verged into crystal ball territory, and offered some excellent insight to think about. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Can you start out by telling us your name and your title? I'm Gabe Isaacson. I'm an associate partner with McKinsey. Can you tell me a little bit more about McKinsey and Company and how you came into your current role there? Definitely. McKinsey and Company is a global consulting firm. And what we do as a firm is we work with companies of all sizes, across all industries, across the world on a series of business problems and questions, be it how to grow, how to be more profitable, how to attract more members, how to be more operationally efficient. And (laughs) specifically at McKinsey, what I do is one of the leaders in our Medicare practice and focus solely on companies that work in the Medicare value chain. So that includes certainly a lot of the insurers some of the providers, a number of the big brokerages, and thinking about obviously an incredible amount of the investor community, like the private equity folks that are looking to invest because Medicare has been such an incredible source of growth in the last few years. So it sounds like you've had positions really all through the healthcare industry chain. That's pretty interesting. How did you get your start into the industry? What was your in? Because I feel like People that are in the Medicare space don't technically go to school thinking that, hey, I'm going to go into selling Medicare or marketing Medicare. So I'm curious how you got into the healthcare industry. Yeah. Early on in my time at McKinsey, I had the privilege of being asked to join a team that was working with an insurer, a payer who only served these government lines of business, only did Medicare, Medicaid, and the dual eligible population. Mm -hmm. And just, it was an incredibly exciting thing for me. I mean, this is a population where there was so much opportunity. I get to think about how to actually work with these folks the same way a broker does, trying to think very specifically about what it looks like to understand the needs of these folks and deliver for them. And thankfully in my world, I think about how we do marketing and education, how we do Mm -hmm. sales and onboarding, how we do care management and member engagement, how we do care delivery and keep folks healthy, right? And so I think that just getting a little bit of a taste of that, exciting, motivating, and has been a journey for the last number of years now. Right. There's a lot to this industry that I could not say upon entering it that I could have seen where I am today, geeking out over compliance, really loving reading through legislation and seeing how different plans and systems are going to change as time goes on. But here we are. And that's what we talk about a lot here on the show. And I think something that we talk about quite a lot, if you've been in the industry, most people have probably heard this quote that we throw around that as the baby boomer generation ages in a Medicare That means 10,000 seniors turn 65 every day. But something that we tend to leave out is that there is a year associated with the end of the baby boomer generation aging into Medicare. This stat only carries us to 2030. Then we'll start to see Gen X, which is a smaller generational cohort, start to age into retirement. So I guess what I'd like to talk about today is come 2030, what's next? And I feel like you're in a good position with your experience and with the knowledge base that you have sort of talk about those things. And I think the first overarching question that I have is, 
what will the Medicare market look like in 2030 and moving forward based on the current data? Yeah, absolutely. I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the the future of the Medicare program across the board. And I think 2030, it's going to look uh, an incredibly different world. A few mm-hmm. things. One is we're projecting that there is just going to be incredible growth in that 75 to 85 and 85 plus population. And mm-hmm. so where when we think about Medicare, it's been the archetype of a 65 year old, a 68 year old folks mm-hmm. who are either aging in or just in that initial time of moving from original Medicare into MA, we're going to have a much more mature population around Medicare Advantage who has been seeing the ads for 10 years, who's been contemplating the plans, but is older and has substantially higher needs, more drugs, more disease conditions, probably more ED visits and things like that. And so what we need to do to deliver for that population will look wildly different. A few other things, what you would imagine is a lot of the products that these folks are buying at 65 right now with Mm -hmm. these cash or cash equivalent benefits, (laughs) very heavy on the supplemental benefits. And obviously if you're relatively healthy and you're 65, these are probably a good fit. $1,200 a year of Aetna's fitness benefit is probably really attractive when you're out there playing a lot of pickleball or whatever the case may be. (laughs) But at 75, 85, those Mm -hmm. needs look a lot different. And maybe it isn't a $0 product with high supplemental benefits, but it's a plan with a modest premium that's going to really wrap them around and cover those inpatient stays and obviously accommodate the drug needs in a more thoughtful way. Mm -hmm. I think the two other things I would say, and certainly we should talk more about the implications for the the agent community, but I think the first thing would just be substantially more integration with their financial questions. As your health needs increase and your health expenditures may increase, what that means in terms of budgeting, retirement, Mm -hmm. social security, financial products, things of that nature becomes inextricably linked. And fundamentally, if we're advising folks on only one part of that, we are doing it wrong. And then the other thing relatedly is probably just a lot more engagement with members, making sure that products sustain being a good fit for them. And it isn't just calling them around AEP or every other AEP or whatever the case may be, but it is frequently because we expect these things to change pretty rapidly, pretty rapidly. with these folks. And what that means for looking at dual eligible products or CSNPs or five-star products, if needs change during the year, would expect it to be a lot more. Right. You mentioned demographics as far as that larger population of older beneficiaries. Where do you see any changes possibly coming in with the opportunity available with the younger market that's going to be coming in to the era of retirement with having this larger cohort that maybe has more utilization, there's more risk in the plans. What could that possibly look like for Gen X as they're coming in? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that one thing that this baby boomer rush has proven is that the ability to create an incredible array of products with similarities, but just modest differences that are really attractive at 65. I I think the payers feel very confident that they have Mm -hmm. made a great amount of progress on that. And so I think if we think about this remaining but more modest trickle of folks turning 65, Mm -hmm. would imagine that the the rush into MA for a lot of those folks could continue with pace as we Mm -hmm. think about MA penetration and our projections that the government's projections all expected to continue to rise, right? And I think it is because we have gotten really good at this, you know, product design piece and and really meeting folks where they are more notably Mm -hmm. at the 65 age than the 85 age. And so would think that we'll be quite quite good there, but, and we should talk about it, but there are just a number of changes and disruptions happening to the Medicare program that are Mm -hmm. most directly impacting the insurers, but obviously those trickle down to the members through behaviors, engagement, product changes, and does create some uncertainty around what it will look like in the next five, eight, 10 years. Right. Talking about plans a little bit, you mentioned, yeah, for someone at the 65, 68 year old mark, then a Medicare Advantage with those benefits, that is very attractive as that population ages. Maybe there's an original Medicare solution with a MedSup that's more appropriate. Maybe it's going to be one of those DSNP or CSNP plans. Do you ever see the possibility of new plan creation with almost something in between the Medicare Advantage plan and the coverage stability of the original Medicare and MedSup, how comprehensive that coverage is. 
just as another option for spreading around risk versus cost versus utilization. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we've had a number of payer clients in the last few years talk about what are the ideas to get to a MedSup MA hybrid experience, right? Because MA brings a lot of benefits in terms of the supplementals, in terms of the switching flexibility and things of that nature that beneficiaries like. Whereas MedSup, if you economically can get there, brings a lot of confidence and security as well. And so I think those hybrid options are very appealing. I haven't dug into it fully just yet, but I think it's HCSC, uh, Blue Cross in Texas, Illinois, this year has some MedSup lookalike MA products, for instance. And I think that that makes a world of sense, right? For folks that want to switch, but maybe if you've been around an MA, you don't, whatever the case would be with the underwriting to get into MedSup and Mm -hmm. things like that, it's a lot of flex. I think the other thing to keep in mind is these PDP products and the implications on pharmacy, which mm-hmm. can make MA a lot more attractive on the MAPD side. And just obviously we've seen a generally secular shift this year and an increase in prices on the PDP products. But I think what you have there is if you do believe that there's a little bit of a challenge on the standalone PDP side, is that a little bit of a challenge then to the MedSup or original Medicare side? And can we leverage no, that MAPD giving us some of what we want over here and some of what we want over there mm-hmm. makes a world of sense. And you know, definitely seems to be a conversation both on the beneficiary agent side and then also on the payer side as they think about 2025 products already. Right. And as we're talking about cost, when I'm thinking about this large population of people in that 75 to 85 year old range, possibly having higher utilization, needing to access care, driving up utilization and cost on these plans. What does that mean then for the people who are aging in and coming in to these plans at 65? Is the system set up to handle all of these people, this large cohort of this more aged group? I don't even know if that's a great way of saying that, but are they able to handle a large population, 75 to 85, and also an influx of new members coming into these plans? Yeah, I mean, the answer to that is probably at this moment, no. And I think that we have a few more years of folks trying to get very thoughtful about this and Mm -hmm. building out a few dimensions to it, right? I think that when we talk about the utilization piece, we have already lost the battle. One on the preventative, what does that member engagement look like? Getting them engaged in the preventative activities, the wellness visits, obviously closing their star gaps and sort of the integration there with just good wellness behaviors. And then the other piece would be um, around building, especially on the insurer side, and I think we're still in early days of this, but what do those care models look like? for Mm -hmm. the 75 to 85 population. And I think just having worked with a lot of these insurers and seen it live, what you often see is incredible amount of rigor for the care models on the DSNP and on the CSNP side. On the non-SNP side, a little bit less traditional focus there. Maybe a little bit on your highest need or certain disease cohorts and things like that. But I think when this is, this is so incredibly applicable for the agent community too. But what we have to assume is that in a number of years, when the legacy non-SNP population is 80 years old with more needs, needs, maybe not quite the same resources, does Mm -hmm. everybody start to look like a DSNP in a lot of ways, right? Whether their plan is that, I don't know. But does Mm -hmm. engaging them both as an agent and on the plan side start to look like that? I think there's a good case to say that that's increasingly going to be the case and what that means for all of us in terms of how we engage folks, how we make sure the plans are a good fit, how we be thoughtful about their sort of social needs as much as their health needs and the financial needs uh, becomes a bigger part of the story. Right, and we're really getting into seeing that more and more that there is more of a focus on the social determinants of health as a factor that it's not just, hey, here's your healthcare situation. That's the only thing that factors into how you're receiving care and and your outcome. We might be skipping a little bit ahead here, but if we are truly moving toward value-based care, if that is the way that we want to go because we've seen that it's a better system as far as focusing on that healthy outcome, how do we really balance the current cost of that system of care with where beneficiaries will be in 10 to 20 years? Do you think that that's still going to be a feasible model moving forward? to that 
time frame or do you think that still needs maybe some adjustment or maybe another risk model in there to offset potential cost? Yeah. I mean, this is a podcast and a lifetime of questions unto itself. And so I think there's a lot there. I think <laughs> if we were to try to bring this to just like the simplest factors, I think mm -hmm. number one would be these, especially these like senior specific value-based care providers, the primary care, maybe some of the specialty, whatever it is, like those would deliver good outcomes. Th those are mm -hmm. delivering real medical cost savings. They are keeping people healthy. For the most part, folks are very happy in those models. Those are good models. And by mm -hmm. the way, I, I'm a big believer that people vote with their pocketbooks. And what are we seeing this year? We're seeing Humana. We're seeing other folks basically incentivize members to go to those, right? Yes. They're putting money on your flex card if you go to one of these providers. So I think we have to assume that we're creating something here that's a win-win yes. all around. Yeah. I think, I think the, the, the general shift there is good. I think the thing there, and especially for the agent community, is just it is incredible churn in these provider groups. And it looks like the early days of some of the e-brokers in terms of those churn levels, right? And what in the world is going on there? Because I fundamentally believe that switching your provider with that amount of frequency, if you're in this higher need group, just is nowhere near good for health outcomes and for getting you right. in the right care programs. And so what does that look like in terms of this incredible volume of churn, having agents out there, you have agents from the providers, you obviously have the traditional broker community, you have brokerages that are stood up just to wrap around these value-based care providers to help folks get into the plans that everyone wants them to be in and things like that. And so I think we're still in early days of it. And does that mean necessarily that going to a provider owned by your payer is inherently better? Not mm -hmm. necessarily, certainly not. But I think that just optimizing this, getting in the right provider, getting in the right plan, and then getting you onboarded, understood, and sticky is going to be the best thing. And I think this just general churn and disruption on the payer and provider side is just genuinely not good for the beneficiaries. And we, and I say we as you, me, basically all of us that work in this market, that's the biggest thing we have to solve. It's just getting some amount of stability because mm -hmm. that's what's going to be best for these beneficiaries. And in the long run, it'll be actually good for their happiness and health. But sort of that initial hump of, of getting everyone onboarded, both payer and provider, I don't think we're doing a great job of that. Gotcha. Now, one thing that we haven't really focused on here is the takeaways for agents. And I think even just talking through this, you've highlighted some different areas where agents can really hone in and focus in on how they can be the person to help a client navigate this field and also direct them towards these healthy outcomes, making sure that they understand that just like you said, hey, switching these providers every year, every quarter, whatever it's going to be, isn't necessarily going to be the best outcome for you as far as tracking whatever health issue you have depending on what it is, if it's something that needs to be consistently managed, that it has a one-year, two-year, three-year scope of how it needs to be handled and how it needs to be tracked and documented and all of those things, what really should an agent be focusing on when it comes to how they think about the potential changes that are coming in the very near future? Yeah. I'm a person that believes, having worked with a lot of payers and, and will hopefully a lot of insurers, whatever the case may be, and we'll see if any of them have feedback for me on this. I genuinely believe that the broker community and the agent community does a great service here for sure. the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Like these are the folks that are helping you navigate the ecosystem. I have grandparents that are trying to navigate it. And when my grandmother needed a dental buy-up, I found a brokerage that I trust and had her call the brokerage, right? Like I don't even right. trust my own ability to navigate it and I eat, sleep and breathe this stuff, right? And so I think there's an incredible amount of value there. I think if I were to think about a few things for folks to think about, number one would be, and, and I'm sure this looks different for any individual person, but if we were to take the eight or nine million people that will enroll in a new Medicare Advantage plan each year, just for instance, right? Historically, mm -hmm. that has been majority that are picking an MA plan for the first time new to Medicare okay. with all the baby boomers, maybe 60, 40 new to Medicare, picking a part C plan for the first time. And in the last year or so, maybe it was last year, maybe it's this year I've seen that switch. And now the majority of people that buy a new plan are switchers and they're buying mm -hmm. their second or third or heaven forbid, fourth or fifth part C plan. And what that means as an agent in terms of that needs assessment or call it what you want, right? It looks an incredibly, it looks incredibly different. 
when someone's buying a Part C plan for the first time, their alternative is MedSup, original Mediclare. There's this like do nothing option, right? There's an education right. component that's incredibly crucial. And when someone's mm -hmm. a switcher, maybe that needs assessment looks a lot like, what did you like about that Aetna plan you were in? But you're calling me, there's clearly something you didn't like, let's hone in on that, right? Mm -hmm. let's, let's not do any harm, let's make sure your PCP and your drugs are still there that dental HMO was really tough for you to navigate, that you really care about, that, whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. Point being is that I think that we will need to evolve how we, I don't even want to call it sell, but really how we engage folks in a thoughtful mm -hmm. manner, meeting them where they are. And it sounds intuitive, but when it starts to become the majority, it's a fundamental shift to how we engage with our it's quoting our engines, quote. the sequencing of how we ask questions, things of that nature, right? So I think that's number one. I think number two, this is the time, and we all know, increasing number of plans per county, per beneficiary, whatever you want. Appreciating the full scope of the plans that are out there mm -hmm. is more important than ever. And candidly, having some like hard conversations and being a real counselor to beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? Is I mean that selling them dessert might be easier, but selling them some broccoli is going to be a little better. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And having conversations about this premium is an obvious thing you'll pay every month and no, mm -hmm. you're not going to get that part B give back. But if we think about spending a couple of days in the hospital, this is going to save you money. And even more importantly, this might keep you healthier and things like that. Right. And so I think it's, uh, and you're listening to your podcast with Ben Miller, right? It's not just the C snips and the D snips, but also full aperture of the non snip product array and making sure that we're thoughtful about that. And I appreciate how the agent community tries to play a role in synthesizing or, or making it simple, right? And having that array of, oh, well, 90% of people will benefit from one of these five products. And so I'm just gonna really get really deep on these five. And I think what does that look like? Leveraging the tools and technology that are out there and things like that to be a little bit more broad where you need to be to make sure that we're mm -hmm. delivering for folks. And that that will be ROI positive for the agent community, right? If we make good matches, we all win, but that's not easy. A uh, couple other quick things. One would be, and I, I admire everyone who's out there doing this greatly, but we are seeing just the durability, which means what? Which means it's not going away, of the call center channel. That is not going away. And performance, put it off to the side for a second, right? But it is doing incredible amount of volume every year. That is 40% of everyone who picks an MA plan is going to come through that channel. And what does that mean in terms of just making sure that we're reaching all of the beneficiaries out there? And what does that mean in terms of needing to be a little thoughtful about our marketing and needing to be accessible by phone and needing to do some of that more work? It's different motion, different way of engaging folks. But uh, there's a lot of folks out there that really like that. And we need to think about what that means. And then also how we do it better, right, in terms of making that connection and putting them in a good product, right, that broccoli versus dessert thing, which mm -hmm. is more important telephonically, to be honest. Two final thoughts, sorry, is just number one is that this piece around the financial piece, another hard conversation, but being very thoughtful about where folks are economically, their health needs and their economic needs inextricably linked. And as we think about the switcher population, a big part of it is at 65, I did X, Y, Z, and my economic situation was whatever it was. At 75, my health needs are this, and my economic needs are this. We just can't underclub that, and it's about being comprehensive counselors. And that goes for the agents that are financial advisors and are selling financial products and also the ones that aren't. And if you're not selling them anything, all the more reason for you to be an honest, unbiased advisor, and it's going to make your healthcare thoughts even richer, right? And then the very last piece is just so much attentiveness. It's almost first principles, but just so much attentiveness to the pharmacy, the drugs, and the provider. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of noise out there. Oh, let's get you in this mail order pharmacy. Oh, this one has lots of stars and all of that, right? But we yeah. need to be thoughtful about getting the beneficiaries to the right place. Do we know this provider? Does the beneficiary have a provider, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's an incredible amount of risk for all parties, for the agent, for the retention, for the beneficiary, for their experience, and for the beneficiary, for their health. And uh, I think sometimes we get a little lax on that. And obviously, as we shift into a PPO world very heavily, then it mm -hmm. feels a little less important or it feels a little bit less a part of that world. But we can't underclub that. And uh, we just can't get lazy around some of those fundamental things that are actually the most determinative of everything. I think those are some good takeaways for people to think about and really mirrors a lot of what we try and explain to agents about interactions with your clients to work on that role of the trusted advisor rather than just trying to sell a product. I don't know if you want to get into it. I did have a question on this here about trust fund solvency. Are we moving toward a future where 
possibly Medicare Part A might not be available premium free. Yeah, I mean, I'm not necessarily going to opine on what the federal government's going to do for a variety of reasons. But what I will tell you is this, is I will tell you is that are we boiling frogs? Is that the analogy? Which is just mm -hmm. there's this sort of everyone thinks the trust fund is going to run out of money one day and it'll, things will collapse, right? Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's going to be much, much, much more gradual. Okay. And what I mean by that is in the last 12 months, we have seen huge changes to the risk adjustment program. Mm -hmm. Huge changes to the STARS program. Huge changes around pharmacy and Part D from the Inflation Reduction Act. Meaningful changes just in terms of the annual revenue change, the sort of Medicare rates, right, that the government pays out to the payers. That These are all happening at once. And so I think to the extent that we expect in 2031 someone to just put up a going out of business sign, I think we can probably be sure that that's unlikely to happen uh, in mm -hmm. sort of this big bang effect. But are we are we all boiling frogs here? And is the environment going to get a little more incrementally complex or challenging mm -hmm. in the coming years as we get there to try and create some sustainability and durability in the program? I would say we're already probably experiencing that. And what does that mean in terms of product richness? And it's tough to say, right? And I think we'll see it as time goes on. My one piece of counsel would just be, I think that the, as I would say, the error bars or the uncertainty year over year is going mm -hmm. to be enormous. And I think that that's just going to keep all of us on our toes for a long time to come. <laughs> well, thank you for answering that question. It was a crystal ball question. I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer at this point, or even an answer that is written in legislation anywhere. I guess my final question would be, do you have any advice for agents who are selling for this AEP, this enrollment period, maybe even next year's enrollment period? We talked about what we want to focus on far, far in the future from now, but what about what about today? What should we be focusing on? Yeah, I think that the, and we've talked about it a few times during this conversation, right? Those enduring fundamentals. Mm -hmm. I think that the I enduring think fundamentals are evergreen. Uh, I think if we're out there doing the right things, asking the right questions, being honest mm -hmm. students of the market and honest, good advisors to our clients, drugs, pharmacies, doctors, but then also really deep understanding of the products, the benefits, the experience associated with it. I think those things are true when our clients are 66 and picking a Part C plan for the first time. I think they're true when the folks are 76. And I think they're true when the folks are 86. And the reality is, is there's a level of sort of acuteness or importance or, or how hard it gets that is going to change. Mm -hmm. But folks don't go from being 66 to 76. They actually get there one year at a time, right? And I think that we're just going to keep doing this incrementally. And we just have to be aware that these things are happening and that they're going to put stress on us in different ways. But uh, we behaviorally should do our best yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I think a lot of that will be enduring, but we should keep our eye on the big, big changes too. Gotcha. Well, Gabe, thank you so much for answering my questions. Thank you for agreeing to be here today and definitely look forward to having you back in the future as well. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. This was a blast. Special thanks again to Gabe Isaacson. Really appreciate you reaching out to share your expertise and, of course, answering my questions. And it is very difficult to answer questions about what might happen seven years in the future based on our current knowledge. It's difficult, but it's also a lot of fun. So thank you again, Gabe, for being so kind and being a great sport while answering these questions. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you check out our notes. There are some resources there that I think you'll enjoy. Links to McKinsey and Company, links to McKinsey and Company, the research they do, their blog, as well as more episodes of this podcast. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this installment of the Agent Survival Guide podcast. We will see you next episode. The Agent Survival Guide podcast is a production of Ritter Insurance Marketing, an integrity company. This episode was recorded and produced by me, Sarah Rupel. Special thanks to Gabe Isaacson for the interview. Script proofing by Tina Lamaru. Podcast designed by Urban Rivera. Artwork by Vivian Zhao. Follow along with our show wherever you like to listen. Listen.